this is Ueni Priory, and um, many of them were in watercolors, and Turner, again, was part of a movement, I should say, that um, apart from actually working for people like Thomas Malton and, jo and John Hardwick, um, the other very important place for the very young Turner was uh, a so-called academy, which went on Friday evenings um, in the rooms of a man called Dr. Thomas Munro um, in the Adelphi off the Strand. He also had rooms in Bedford Square. And Thomas Munro was actually uh, a doctor for the insane who ended up actually treating Turner's own mother, Mary Turner. Um, and he had a very important sort of patient in the 1790s when Turner would have known him, Michael John Robert Cousins, um, who was an extraordinary watercolorist. And John Robert Cousins had done more than any other living English artist to try and create from what was thought to be the demure and amateurish genre of watercolors, something which had the strength and poetic majesty of oils. And Turner had the same sense. I think, from encountering cousins, and he encountered not the real cousins, who was himself, as I say, sort of mentally unwell, in charge of Munro, but one of the things that he did at Munro's Academy in the Adelphi was to, um, was actually to, uh, was to sort of finish some of the, the, the images that hadn't been completed, or engravings after cousins that needed hand coloring. So developed, I think, a relationship with a potential poetic um, majesty of Cousins' kind of watercolors. Along with him was an artist called Gertin, who was exceptionally talented watercolorist, and indeed Turner paid him the compliment. Gertin died very young to say if Gertin had lived, I would not be known myself. But you can see in some of these extraordinary studies in which light and dark, ruin um, and illumination, um, uh, sort of druidical figures actually wandering in from interminably lit doors. The sense of light as itself a sort of poetic conduit of memory between past and future. Um, over and over again, the kind of poetic themes, there's Tintin Abbey itself. Um, a romantic trope in all romantic painting, of course, was actually that from Tintin Abbey was one of the abbeys that had been destroyed during the Reformation when the monasteries had been closed by Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell. And, of course, it's now festooned with the burgeoning of organic life, which suggests, again, despite the um, melancholy solemnity of a burnt-out world, um, the burgeoning forth of natural vegetation and of a natural future. And there is Westminster Abbey, uh, so -called Saint, the tomb of so-called Saint Erasmus in an aisle of Westminster Abbey. Turn as usual, as we're about to see in a minute, good, goodness, time is, isn't, doesn't time fly past when I, at any rate, am having fun? Um, <laughs> Um, Turner, as usual, even though Westminster Abbey is a lofty place, as you'll know, um, exaggerates romantically and poetically, just as he exaggerated um, and took huge poetic license with the fighting Temeraire tugged to its last uh, birth at the Breakers' Yard, in order to give a sense that somehow, whatever our Britain will become in the Industrial Age, it needs to drench itself in the light of, of poetic memory. And there's something, of course, about actually the Gothic revival beginning to be a serious, uh, a serious issue in the history of British taste. The whole of the Pugin book I mentioned, Contrast, was a manifesto for the restoration of the English perpendicular style of the 15th and 14th century. In Gothic, because Gothic was thought to have been originated from the overarching connecting forest of trees, Gothic was the opposite from classical architecture with its slavish obedience to arithmetic design and geometry. Gothic was something which was a godly style in an ungodly age because it represented in its taste for ornamentation, its curly cues, its vaulting, um, its lancet windows and scents. It imitated the forms of nature itself. So it was the uh, godly Christian style and the style to which Britain was going to return if it was to save its soul in the age of the grad grinds. So there is Turner in um, the wonderful self-portrait, um, crucially face on. Um, for the reason any of you have seen pictures drawn by other people of Turner's nose, it's a rather wonderful nose, um, but it's a peculiar shape. 
and it's avoided in Turner's representation of himself. Here he is with powdered hair. It's not a bad slide, not a bad image. He actually, although he has, of course, no wig, his hair is powdered. A wonderful kind of marriage of the informal and the formal coming at us out of the darkness. Um, again, absolutely standard, but gorgeous, poetic, commonplace. The deep set eyes, the look of a man who's tossed and turned in his sleep. Insomnia for beauty, really, this man could be called. Um, the manifesto, really, of someone who is going to take the kind of humdrum jobbing of topographical architecture and turn it into something that has indisputable historical and poetic bigness. And the instance of that is Dolbadden Castle, which uh, the painting itself in the possession of the Royal Academy, because that was his submission painting for becoming an associate rather than a mere student apprentice of the Royal Academy. So this is shown in the Royal Academy in London, um, then housed in Somerset House, by the way. Um, it moves from Somerset House um, to Trafalgar Square, where it's given quarters by the National Gallery in the, in the 1830s, when the National Gallery itself um, sets up shop in Trafalgar Square, the same building that's there right now. So it's, it's, it's been discolored then, Frey, but you get the idea again. Dol Baden is in Wales, and it's really just a sort of... Um, it's not much more. I've been there. It's a sort of, you'd say, a grassy mound instead of this kind of magnificent, storm-tossed, sheer cliff-like place that Turner has invented from his desire to sort of juice up the poetic melodrama. Turner's also taken advantage, and um, if you think I'm being long-winded, it could be a lot worse. I could recite Turner's poetry to you, actually, <laughs> which would send you scurrying for the exits in the beautiful autumn day. Um, but a, a, a regulation had just been passed which enabled poets to append um, either their poems or other people's poems to paintings, and indeed Turner did this uh, to Dolbadden Castle. Um, he made it sure that everybody knew the story. Um, this extraordinary kind of rock that's backlit at the top of its crag, and there's something potentially strange and violent. Oh, sorry, I wanted to go back. Sorry, that's not Turner. Um, potentially violent going down on there, and we're not quite sure what, actually, um, by the sort of foaming brook beneath the crag there. Um, it's, it, 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 it's obscene from a story in the history, 13th century history, um, of Wales, when Wales is about to be conquered by um, King Edward I. And there is, uh, it's a war, actually, between two brothers, Llewellyn Griffith, who was the leader of, who was really the Prince of Wales at the time, and therefore hostile to the English invasion, who's actually imprisoned his own brother, who was called Owen Goch Griffith, in that tower. And if you actually went into the details of the story, it's all sort of a bit at odds with what you would expect the kind of romantic gist of this story to be, because in fact, Owen Goch, after a long period of imprisonment, is actually liberated by the English invasion. But the whole sense of the way in which the Welsh-English story was told in the 1790s was sort of the opposite, that the Welsh had been the embodiment of bardic and druidical, mystical uh, liberty, who'd been you know, trampled underneath the clod-hopping feet of the Plantagenet monarchy. All that Turner wanted to do, as we know from his unfortunate verse, is to represent this as somehow the crucifixion of liberty itself, that the stone and the rock and the ruin become the enduring memory of the imprisonment of Owen Goch himself. So the sense in which geography was history, that geography itself, whether it was a kind of ruined church or whether it was a kind of a, a peak like this, somehow actually spoke poetic volumes to you, was indeed something that was instantly successful, both in the academy um, and outside. And it was what Turner was after when he wanted to try and make British history painting. Whatever British painting had been, really, it, it had never been history painting about the fate of Britain itself. Um, under the aegis of Joshua Reynolds, it had been painting about the Romans and Greeks. It had been fine portrait painting. Every time there'd been an attempt, actually, to create an indigenous school of British history painting, it had been a kind of ignominious um, and often embarrassing flop.